indeed, Lord, you are glorified and you're exalted above every name, above every thought, above every crown, O oh Lord. We are grateful, Lord, for this opportunity to meet and to gather in your name, Lord. As we fellowship together, as we hear from you, Lord, may you be with us, guide us, and teach us. May our hearts be open to you, and may we be instructed uh, through your Holy Spirit. Uh, we bless you, Father, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, let's celebrate Jesus. Yes, thank you, our worship team. We may have our seats. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Nagea Daido. Uh, welcome to uh, Deliverance Church. Um, we are glad you're here. Uh, this is the Daughters of Impact uh, April edition, and we want to learn uh, about ourselves and the law. Um, I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Um, I work under the Office of the Attorney General and Department of Justice as a state counsel uh, in a department called um, the Advocates Complaints Commission. We handle uh, ca complaints by members of the public uh, relating to professional misconduct. So if you have such kind, uh, you can be assisted in organization. Yes, and um, just as we begin, I'd like to thank uh, our bishop and Pastor Alice, um, the entire pastoral team, and the DOI uh, April edition organizing team uh, for this opportunity uh, they have given me to minister with us today. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. I also would like to give a shout out to uh, Tahila Cell, uh, who are where we fellowship. We also thank the Group 36 ladies, where I'm a member, and the youth team are blaze. I'm a, uh, my family at home, um, I'm grateful that I belong there. So we go straight into the word. Um, our key verse uh, is from Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, but we'll begin um, with verse 1. It says, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Therefore the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beast of the field and the birds of the air. Even the fish of the sea will be taken away. Now let no man contend or rebuke another, for you people are like those who contend with the priest. Therefore you shall stumble in the day, the prophet also shall stumble uh, with you in the night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being priests for me, because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. So in this scripture, we see that uh, in Israel, um, the level of vices had really increased uh, because the people had forgotten the knowledge of the law of God. And God was going to let them perish together with their children, as we have seen in, um, uh, in our kivas, Hosea 4, 6. And then uh, even the mothers were going to be punished. And this being a, a ladies' forum, it's a challenge for us as women to be... Um, to continue standing in the gap for our families so that we don't go this path where God is saying uh, he doesn't want these people to be priests for, for them. And so um, in line with this, we want to see this law of God, how does it connect with the law of the land? Because God is the author of the law as we have seen. Uh, he gave the law through his servants, um, Moses and the others, and so we have um, them being captured in um, in uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and the rest. So, um, the purpose of that law when he was giving it was to reveal his righteous standard 
of absolute righteousness. Um, and so he, through the law, they were able to learn that he's a holy God. And um, no, no one will be able to attain to that standard um, as humans by virtue of the law that was given. That one can be found in James 2.10, Matthew 23.37-40, to 40, and also the Sermon on the Mountain. The Matthew uh, gives the two commandments of loving God and your neighbor, and then James refers to um, if you break one, uh, one law, then you have broken everything. The other aspect, the purpose of the law, was to convict us of all our true moral guilt before him. Uh, so the law was to be used to silence us, and keep us accountable to God and know that there's no justification through the law. By following the law itself, we'll not be able to attain to righteousness because um, as humans, we are not able to follow all the the regulations that were given in that time. That one is captured in Romans 3.19, part B. And so from that, we see our utter failure to keep God's law should drive us to the gospel of salvation. So if we see that we are not able to capture, to fulfill all the righteous requirements of the law, our solution becomes Jesus, uh, who is the uh, high priest, and who fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law. And when we believe in him, then we are able to receive salvation by grace, through faith. And then we, we become justified and his righteousness is imputed upon us as given in Romans 22, 26. So um, the law of God um, informs or shapes the law of the land. Uh, the law of the land is a wide subject. Uh, it gives, uh, it covers um, areas uh, of the basics of our daily activities such as going to work, uh, from buying vegetables and such like, to national matters such as choosing leaders, as we'll have next year, God willing, and uh, matters of social amenities, um, where we have hospitals which are not properly equipped. Those are things that concern the law. We also have matters of international law, uh, where, uh, for instance, management of resources from the various continents and uh, the operations of world financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. And we have examples of that, and uh, such as um, world health, uh, like the current pandemic. So the law will concern itself of such issues. But today we're just going to cover a few areas for the benefit of um, this discussion. The first area is uh, legal education in Kenya. Um, For the sake of our candidates who are at home, congratulations for those who finished from four and those who are aspiring to be lawyers uh, or advocates. So for you to to become an advocate, the statutes that um, guide uh, legal education in Kenya We have the Legal Education Act, number 27 of 2012, the Kenya School of Law Act, and the Council of Legal Education. Uh, So those are what guide and then the status of the universities and the colleges. So your dream can begin from uh, primary school, then you go to high school. um, Where when you're in high school, you're required to have a minimum grade of a C plus uh, in your KCSC and then in your languages, have a minimum of a B plane. Then when you go to your university or college, you study a four years bachelor's of law uh, degree program. Uh, You can be taken into university through the Kenya University and College Central Placement Service, that's the government model, or through the self-sponsored model. Uh, Because of the financing being high, you can uh, uh, use the help or bursaries or scholarships to finance your education. Uh, But if you use help immediately after college or university, you're supposed to start paying. Otherwise, they'll come after you. Uh, After that one, now you go to Kenya School of Law, which is a one and a half year program. Uh, The one year is classwork, then six months minimum is uh, like an internship. We call it pupillage. Um, some institutions give uh, train you for a longer period. 
depending on their availability of resources. So at Kenyan School of Law, you take the advocate training program. Then after that one, there's a waiting period uh, where you apply to the Chief Justice through a petition uh, to, be, to be sworn in as an advocate. So that's now the process. You're given a date as a team, then you are sworn in. You take the oath of office. That whole process is called admission to the bar. So after that, you become an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. So after that, you sign what is called a role of advocates. It's like a register of, of all the advocates in Kenya. The whole process takes around six to seven years, but the active classwork uh, is around five years, then the attachment, and then the waiting season. Um, you can also do a diploma, which is uh, paralegal studies, which is offered at the Kenya School of Law, uh, which is supposed to have attained a C plane uh, minimum or a C plus in your English, your languages. Um, then now you can become a paralegal where you offer support services to advocates. And then there's also continuous professional development programs where you sharpen your skills after you become an advocate. This is also offered with the LSK, which handles all the, the records of the advocates within the country. Uh, you take a license with them, and when you get the CPD points, then uh, you can become an, um, eligible to apply for a license for the coming year. Uh, so you can check through the LSK website uh, if you're the advocate that you're dealing with uh, is um, licensed for that particular year uh, by checking uh, there's a, an advocate search engine. So you can see if the advocate is active or inactive, suspended or struck off. Um, government uh, advocates mostly are inactive or unknown because they're not allowed to take out practicing certificates. After that, now you can ap apply for a master's, which is an LLM. Uh, can be one to two years or more, depending on the pace you take with your research. Then a doctorate, uh, an LLD, and then you become a professor after publication of materials. Then you can also take a higher doctorate. One of my professors took the higher doctorate. Uh, it's, it's higher than just the PhD. Then you can continue to make contributions to the legal profession. And then with time, uh, if the colleagues recognize you, you can become um, a senior counsel. Not every advocate is a senior counsel. It's only a few who are conferred that title by the president. Other institutions that offer legal training are the Ju Judicial Training Institute, uh, which trains magistrates and judges. Uh, the other possible um, career path is the, you can be, you can work with the government, you can work as a private practitioner, you can work with academia, uh, where you become a lecturer, or you can work with companies and such like. So we'll go to the other aspect, family related laws, uh, marriage law. Um, they are captured in the Constitution and the Marriage Act. The core things is that you need to be an adult to get married. It's the person of the opposite sex, and you need to have free consent to get married. The Marriage Act also adds the aspect of monogamous and uh, being registered, um, or polygamous, and your marriage being registered. Um, and your marriage is the same legal status with all others. And you also need to have a witnesses, two competent witnesses. Um, they are not competent if they are below 18 or they have a mental issue um, they are, so that they are not able to understand what is going on or they're intoxicated, like they're drunk, or they don't understand the language uh, that is being presented. So you need to check your best couple if they have these things. If they are, they are not clear, then they are not eligible to, to preside over your marriage, to, to witness your marriage ceremony. There are five types of marriages. Uh, in the act, which is this Christian, civil, Hindu, Islamic, and customary. Uh, Christian, civil, and Hindu are monogamous. Islamic and customary are presumed to be polygamous or potentially polygamous. That means that um, you can convert them, potentially polygamous, to monogamous, but the monogamous cannot be converted to uh, polygamous. If you, you marry through the church, you're not allowed to marry in another model. Yes, and then for co cohabitation, um, it's only, it's not, the act is silent 
previously there's a doctrine called presumption of marriage. Um, it's only recognized under the case law. The decisions by the courts are not um, the act itself. So if you're in a cohabitation relationship, then it's a 50-50 if really you'll obtain the rights that you need uh, when a time comes that a decision needs to be made in your favor. We'll go to matrimonial property. Um, actually, this happens when there's a need to divorce and uh, you uh, divorce or annulment of your marriage. Um, divorce happens because uh, grounds like cruelty, adultery, and such like. Uh, for annulment, you are declared that your marriage never existed. For instance, if your marriage was not consummated, uh, that means like maybe you went for honeymoon, you came back, and nothing happened so sexually. So you can apply to the court to annul your marriage like it never existed. Or you are in a prohibited relationship, uh, like uh, the person married a relative and such like things, so your marriage can be annulled. So after that, how do you deal with your property? Your property, uh, the matrimonial property is your home, matrimonial home, or your household goods, and uh, any movable or immovable property within um, the home that is jointly owned between the two of you. A property owned that, uh, by trust uh, does not, uh, like through the customary law you inherited, does not count as uh, matrimonial property. And uh, property owned before you got married also is not counted as uh, matrimonial property to be divided when you get married when you are divorcing. Uh, you can also have an agreement when you're coming into the marriage. Uh, that's called a prenup, prenuptial agreement or a prenup. Uh, but it can be set aside when there's fraud or coercion uh, that is established. So the ownership of the matrimonial property is established when, uh, be, uh, in accordance to the contribution that you made when you're coming into the marriage. And contribution here is not just monetary, it's also non-monetary. It includes domestic work, um, child care, companionship, management of family business, and farm work. So it's normally quantified and then they divide your property. So when there's a polygamous marriage um, and the property was acquired um, before other wives came into the picture, it's 50-50 if it's uh, between the man and the wife. If it's after other wives came into the picture, then they divide uh, the, the, between all those wives and the man. Uh, but the, if you are in a polygamous relationship and you don't want the other wives to be included in the uh, computation, uh, you can have an agreement to that effect so that the other wives are not included in your calculation. Special provisions on the matrimonial property, there needs to be a special a spousal consent uh, when you want to sell or gift or mortgage your property. You cannot just wake up in the morning, maybe you went to think as Pentecostal, we are, uh, <laughs> we are very notorious. Okay, not notorious really, but we, we, can, we, get, we get ourselves in this area. You went to a prayer mountain and you feel that God wants you to give away a property. And it's a family property. You cannot just give it away. You need to consult with your spouse first before giving it away. And then also with the spousal um, special provision, you can have a right to protect your property. Uh, you can put a caveat or a caution on the property, especially if it's land. And then uh, you are not supposed to be removed from your uh, matrimonial home unless it's, um, uh, it's by a court order. And the court order is when uh, they are executing a decree or there's a bankruptcy proceedings happening, one of the trustee is, uh, needs to get their, uh, their money, or a mortgagee, like the bank, is exercising uh, their power of sale. Uh, then that one will be allowed for you to be removed. But otherwise, you are not allowed, no matter which case, for you to be removed from your matrimonial home. Uh, so before you, put a, uh, you mortgage your home, both of the parties need to be to give an informed consent, a written informed consent about uh, the property being mortgaged. Uh, the presumptions that come in property 
is that uh, if one person is, uh, there's a, one of the property is in the name of one spouse, there's a rebuttable presumption, meaning that it's arguable, 50-50, whether that, that spouse is holding in trust for the other person. If it's held jointly, there's also a rebuttable presumption if that property is, um, is a beneficial, the beneficial interest is to be divided equally. Then for gifts, uh, for spouses, um, maybe uh, uh, the husband decides to buy uh, the wife something, maybe a property or a car or something like that. Uh, it's not that you are not supposed to buy. You can buy, but there's a rebuttable presumption. You can argue it out if that property wholly belongs to that spouse that you have given that particular property. Then we'll go to another area of law, which is the children's law. Um, it's covered by the Constitution and also the Children's Act. Uh, we'll look at the rights of a child. Uh, they have a right to life, non-discrimination, parental care, education, religious education, health care, uh, protection from child labor, to be given a name and nationality, and for disabled children to be treated with dignity and protection from abuse. And also they have a right to leisure and recreation. You can take them for a walk or something just to, to help them as they grow up. Children also, you have, uh, uh, they also have a right to privacy but with parental guidance. So sometimes parents feel uh, they can't question their children because uh, they're using their phones or something like that, but uh, they have privacy, yes, but it needs to be within guidance. And the child is someone be below the age of 18. Children also have duties and responsibilities. Every right has a duty and a responsibility. So uh, their duties and responsibility is to work for the cohesion of their family, uh, to respect their parents and uh, help them when they need uh, to use their skills uh, in service of the nation and not to waste them away with any malpractices and to preserve and strengthen their social and national solidarity. If you violate any of the rights, you, ha you have a penalty of a maximum of 12 months uh, imprisonment or 50,000 shillings fine or both. Then there's something of the parental responsibility. These are duties and rights uh, given by law to a parent uh, as they raise their child. Uh, their duties include um, providing an adequate diet, clothing, shelter, medical care, medical care, education, and guidance. They also have a right uh, to give guidance in matters religious, moral, social, and cultural. They have a right to give them a name uh, and to appoint a guardian and to administer the property of that particular child in the best interest of that child and um, organize for the movement of that child. And when the a child dies, it's the responsibility of the child, of the parent, to organize for their burial or if it's cremation, depending on your uh, preferences. The responsibility is normally for both parents, but in single uh, parent homes, it normally begins with the mother. And then later, uh, the father can come and apply to have a responsibility in the life of the child. And uh, we'll pick something else uh, in the aspects about children, adoption, matters of adoption. Uh, there are homes where parents are not able to get a child and so they opt for uh, adoption. So um, you need to be 21 to, 20, to 65 years and to be 21 years older than that child that you, you want to adopt. And you don't need, you are supposed not to be alone, like, and they're supposed to be opposite gender uh, of the child that you are taking in. The process uh, uh, of adopting a child, normally um, there's an adoption society or an agency involved, so the parent normally takes the child or a guardian, surrenders the child to the society, then um, the prospective adopter makes an application, then a social worker is sent by the agent to assess the, the, how able that uh, 
adopter is able to take care of the child. And then a case committee is set up by the society to look into the application. After that, um, there's organized for around three months visits by the adopter. Then the legal process is when uh, it begins, where you can involve an advocate uh, at the High Court of Kenya. Um, and then after that, the parties are listened, the, what the case before the court, and then now the orders are made if you're eligible to receive that child. Then the registrar enters the name of that child to confirm that that child uh, is being adopted by this couple. Uh, for international adoptions, they were stopped in 2014 because of the increase of um, human trafficking in the country. Uh, we got to another area of law uh, related to family, which is the Sexual Offences Act. It addresses matters uh, uh, of our sexuality. So there is matters of rape, uh, which uh, someone is in prison for 10 years um, if it's confirmed that you, uh, you committed the offense. The key thing about rape is the consent, and it can also happen in marriages. There's marital rape, where when consent is not freely given or there's a threat, or someone is threatened to, to, to the sexual act. Then there's attempted rape, which is five years, to life imprisonment, sexual assault, 10 years, uh, to life imprisonment, uh, indecent acts um, is also five years. Defilement, when now it's like rape, but for a child, if it's, the child is less than 11 years, it's life imprisonment. If the child is between 12 to 15 years, that's 20, year, 20 years, a minimum. And the child is 16 to 18 years, they have a minimum of 15 years. It's a defense if the child uh, had deceived the accused person that they are over 18 years. So our youngsters, if you go around maybe for a bash and you tell a guy you find around that you are over 18 and then defilement happens, then um, it will be a challenge on your part that um, you, you deceived that person that you are of age, yet you are not of age. Uh, if you're found guilty, then you go to a Boston institution. For attempted defilement, it's 10 years, gang rape, 15 years. There's a child prostitution, 10 years, child pornography. When you expose a child to pornographic material or you feed from the um, um, proceeds that you get from that, it's six years to 500,000 uh, that you can be fined. Sexual communication with a child, um, child being even a teenager, uh, youngsters call it sexting. Uh, you conduct the, the sexual act through messages. If you are caught, then you have committed a criminal offense, and that's, uh, you are eligible to be punished uh, and fined for 500,000 or a minimum of five years in prison or both. Um, if you are dealing with a person with mental disability, a child, sometimes parents or guardians feel the person with mental disability, a child, does not make a lot of contribution, so they, they expose them to prostitution. If you found that's 10 years, that child deserves to be given an opportunity to contribute to life. And incest, uh, it's a minimum of 10 years and life imprisonment uh, if it's a child. For persons of, uh, in authority or people in uh, trust, uh, if you are someone managing a, a remand home or a, chill, a custody, that's 10 years. A law enforcement officer, maybe you went to, uh, to lodge a complaint at the police station and the police officer uh, harassed you or committed a sexual offense against you and you able to prove that, then it's around 10 years. Uh, if it's in a hospital, that's 10 years. Uh, it's in a school, also it's 10 years, a head teacher or a teacher. A person in trust generally, that also can apply to pastors or ministers of the gospel because they are in trust. Members of the congre congregation trust their, themselves to these men of God or women of God. And we have cases where people require these people to strip or 
to just expose themselves to, to indecent acts. So if you're caught, then that's for 10 years that you're eligible to be sentenced. Where there's a sexual relationship before this offense, then that one can act as a defense uh, if you, are, you had a relationship with this person. But even if you're in that relationship, but whatever you are doing was unlawful, then you can be caught liable for the offense that you, you have committed. If you trans transmit HIV, that's 15 years. Um, or uh, this, if you spike a drink, I think this time when children are uh, students at home or our youngsters, when you go to a bash and maybe your colleague or your friend uh, spikes your drink, uh, they are eligible to a minimum of 10 years. So that there's a sexual activity to happen. Cultural and sexual offenses, that's a minimum of 10 years. So this one is just a general information in cases of rape so that you're able to get help. So when you, are, you have a case of rape, the first thing you do is to get to a safe place. The other thing, tell someone you trust about what happened because maybe your mind was, is, might not be in a good state because of the trauma, uh, so that they're able to help in the investigation. You tell someone what happened so that the case continues. Then preserve the evidence. The first thing to do, someone normally wants to shower and clear up uh, the, the, whole, the whole thing that happened to you. But that one now will tamper with the legal process that one will want to follow up. So uh, preserve the evidence. If it's a cloth, keep it. Even if it's stained with blood and all those uh, fluids, you need to retain it. And maybe you go to a, before you go to a hospital to be checked, uh, you need to preserve that evidence. Don't shower immediately. You can go to a clinic. You find help. That's when now you come and... Um, now continue with their normal dealings. Then you can get medicine to prevent HIV or unwanted pregnancies uh, after that act. Then you get support uh, to help you recover from the trauma. That can be like um, counseling to help you process that uh, discussion, uh, that process. The other thing, proposal to reduce occurrences of sexual offenses is creating more awareness about the subject, the older and the younger generations to be more open about healthy uh, sex education, the older and the younger generation to build friendships uh, to trust, of trust to help and shield each other. Sometimes you might have maybe a sexual harassment at your workplace, but you don't have someone to talk to, maybe your mom or your auntie, because of the kind of relationship. So, but if there's uh, a free communication, it will be easier uh, when there's uh, any harassment and you're not in a position uh, to defend yourself, the older person can come in to assist you. And then people to be willing to be vulnerable and share their sexual struggles with a trusted person and they're accountable too. The key is the trusted person if your age mates. And then asking God to return his fear of him in our hearts to awaken our conscience because sometimes the conscience of a person has died for you to defile a three months old baby. It's, it's, it's someone really wonders what really happened to you. And help us to see and uphold the sacredness of sex as he intended it to be. Uh, my time is going uh, sana. There's the last part of the laws relating to families, which is the law of succession. Uh, this is matters inheritance of property when uh, someone has died a spouse. So or how it is dealt with is it can either be tested succession or intested succession. Intested happens when tested happens when there's a will. Intested happens when there's no will. Uh, a will uh, can be made by any adult of sound mind. Uh, it can be oral or written. For oral, you need to have two or more competent witnesses, and then the testator needs to have died within three months after they make that will, that declaration. But a written will, it needs to have been signed, and the signature needs to be to show that um, the, people wa the person wanted it to take effect. And a will takes effect after the death of the testator or the person writing the will. Um, it doesn't matter that if you write a will, you're inviting death because most, I think in the African uh, culture, we fear wills because we think we're inviting death, but it's not. It's helping the family to be organized or not to get into unnecessary fights after you are gone. So in tested succession, 
their dependents who are considered, which normally is the wives or the former wives, children, someone you took in, or now the parents, children, and siblings. The wife also inclu includes the person whom you separated. The rights of a surviving spouse, uh, if you're married with children and your spouse dies, then you're entitled to the household effects absolutely and a life interest, like to, own, to have a portion of the property uh, to the time that you are alive till when you die. Uh, if the person is a widow, it ends, your life interest ends when you remarry. So when you remarry, then you, you can't have a claim in the property of your former husband. And the children now take over the estate. The estate is the property of the deceased. If you're married with no children, uh, you have, um, and then you die, your surviving spouse takes the first 10,000 of the residue of your estate or 20%. Uh, of it, uh, whichever is greater. And uh, this, the spouse also has the interest uh, in the property, but when they remarry, it ends. If you, are, if you are not married and have children, that is the case of a single parent, then it's your children, you, it's like you take care of that property till when they are 18, uh, then your children take over. If you are not married and have no children, now, like you're a single person, and maybe you have some property. Uh, then your property goes down to your father first. If dead, your mother, then your siblings and their children, to stepbrothers and sisters and their siblings in equal shares, then relatives. If you don't have a relative, surviving relative, then um, the property goes to the state, to the nation. They, they absorb it. There's a, there's an organi there's a committee or a organization handling assets that have not been claimed so it goes back there so if you so that's about the rights of surviving spouses then there's a father uh, if it's in a polygamous um, a situation and um, you are wondering how the property will be divided it's um, equally between if it's before uh, the property was acquired, it happens like the matrimonial property case. If it's before, the property was acquired before other wives, then the man and the wife get and their families. If it's after, then they, they divide equally among themselves. What can I do if our relatives deny us the right to inherit our parents' property? This happens, relatives take your property or they come after the death of your parents, they just pick away everything. You have three ways to try to handle that. Uh, you can put a caution or a caveat, if, especially if it's land, at the land register's pro, uh, office. That prevents any sale or any division, any dealing in that land until it is determined the way forward. You can also put an injunction. Uh, injunction is an order of the court um, that nothing happens until it's determined. So you can seek that one uh, so that until it's clarified. Uh, if now the succession has begun, you now put an objection because there's normally a period to invite objections from members of the public. So you put an objection that you are not included in this process and we are part of this family. So then now your interests are considered. Yes, so that's about if our relatives have taken the properties of your parents and of your family. The other thing, apart from the uh, land, what else can I inherit from my parents? Apart from land, you can inherit M-Pesa account, shares, bank accounts, uh, circle savings, pension, and such like. It's not just land that you inherit. The money that was uh, remained, you can get something out of it. My father had a case in court relating to our land before he passed on. What can I do? So if your parents passed on uh, and there's a pending case, you can apply to court uh, and attach the death certificate for a successor to be appointed, someone to take over the case for it to continue, then that way um, the case can continue. Otherwise, it will be dismissed because there is uh, no one to continue with the case. And you should do that within 90 days. And then where do you file the petition uh, in matters of succession? Um, if it's an estate or the worth of the property remaining is... 300,000 and below, you file it at the magistrate courts. If it's higher, then you file it in the high court, uh, where their jurisdiction is higher uh, 
of the amount of things they can handle. So normally for you to administer the, the property, you need uh, to manage that property, you need what we call a grant of letters of administration. What you need to put there uh, is the names of the deceased, the date and the place, uh, non-residence, uh, if there's a will, you attach it and such like of things. Uh, for you, the priority of someone to apply for a grant to manage that particular property, the first person who is given priority is the spouse um, and the other beneficiaries uh, or spouses. The other people who are given priority are children, the father of that deceased person, the mother, then the brothers and sisters, and any child that the deceased um, brothers, the sisters had. There's also the public trustee. This is an arm of the government. Uh, which um, tries to manage on behalf of, uh, of people. The person entitled to a grant does not, is, is not supposed to be a minor, someone below 18. They need to be of sound mind, and uh, it's supposed to be four people uh, and below, uh, not more than four people. And a company cannot apply unless it's the public trustee. A person who interferes with the property, that's called intermeddling, and they are, they are liable for a maximum of 10,000 or one year imprisonment for both. And then the person who has been appointed, they'll be answerable to them. The process of applying for a grant, you obtain these documents, a petition for summons, affidavits, a letter from the chief, a consent from the people who are, who are not applying, and evidence of ownership of the assets, and uh, the consent, yes, we have managed, and any, if there's a will, you also uh, obtain it. Uh, so after you obtain those documents, uh, you lodge it at there, uh, and you, you have identified the people to apply, and the property of the deceased person and the beneficiaries, then you lodge at the high court. After that, there's a gazettement of 30 days for objections, and then determination of that objection, then uh, after six months, uh, there's confirmation of that grant, and then now you can uh, subdivide the property. Uh, where you can find help and support, you can get it from FIDA, LSK, our Advocates Complaints Commission, the organization I mentioned, the Ombudsman, uh, the Kenya National Commission of Human Rights, uh, NGOs that deal with uh, human rights can assist you in these matters, psychologists and therapists, churches also assist, and also the media uh, also assist. Like the, the lady who made uh, uh, voice the, uh, the, uh, what was happening on Tika Road the other day, and it assisted that people found help because of what she did. So that's a way also of uh, trying to seek for help. And with that, uh, it ends uh, our discussion. Let's continue to pray for ourselves so that we may be faithful stewards uh, of what God has given us and um, so that we may be connected. We may follow what needs to be done, educate ourselves uh, on what needs to be done because ignorance of the law is not a defense and so we may be faithful uh, in whatever area that God has called us. Yes, thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'd invite. God bless you.